It's just common sense. More handguns means more handgun crime, right? Let's have a look. There's a lot of background and setup to this video, but if you're just looking for the core stats, numbers, and graphs without the need for context or sources, you can skip ahead to this timestamp. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be taking a quick look at some handgun stats regarding the handgun freeze. Over the last few months I've been compiling a lot of information and going through a lot of court cases and so on with the intention of making a sort of C21 versus the Charter video or video series. That video project's still quite a ways off. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work to do that. And I've got a lot of learning still to do in order to really make that video as accurate as possible and as good as possible. But I do want to share something with you guys that I kind of discovered while gathering information for this video. Now this probably comes as no surprise to really anybody who's familiar with the firearms conversation. We in the gun community have, have said for years now, decades even, although I haven't been part of the fight for that long, but for a for long time now, we in the gun community have been saying, you know, it's not the legal gun owners, it's not lawful ownership of firearms, it's not any of this stuff, it's criminals and so on and so on. I mean, it's, it's kind of an old tired story at this point. And so I know it's true, you know it's true, but there's always been the, the difficulty of finding the stats on this. For whatever reason, the government or police forces or whatever the case might be, they don't actually have good centralized data nationwide for what proportion of firearms used in crimes are either held in the hand of a lawful owner or had lawful origins. Individual jurisdictions across Canada do track this number, but there's no national number anywhere. So it's always been a difficult part of the conversation to really concretely define or state exactly what the numbers are regarding any particular firearm stat. However, there are some stats that we do have that I think paint a pretty amazing picture of just exactly how ridiculous this is and how, how ludicrously lopsided some of these numbers are, despite the fact that the government went ahead with their handgun freeze anyway. So the stats we're going to use come from two articles primarily, and they're both Government of Canada articles, which means these are not really open to interpretation or open to speculation. These aren't articles from a newspaper or anything like that. This is core information that the government of Canada itself, meaning the Liberal government, in, at least in some sense, has intentionally put out there for us and for themselves to use. So these numbers are going to be about as accurate as we can hope to get them. And at the very least, the Liberals and the anti-gun lobby have no business questioning them because these are their numbers. <laughs> These are the numbers that the, the government themselves are putting out. So this is the first article and this shows us exactly how many handguns are purchased every year over the last decade. If you're familiar with this conversation, if you're familiar with C21, Marco Medicino regularly during the process of C21 before he got fired for lying so much, but during the process of C21 he regularly cited and a number of other government officials regularly cited 50,000 handguns per year, or 45,000 to 55,000, or 40,000 to 60,000. Now, it is worth noting, though, those numbers are for handgun registration certificates. That's new registrations. That's not necessarily new handguns. So when they say 45,000 to 50,000, that's the number of, of registrations that go through, not the number of individual firearms that are brought into the country. They never actually technically disclose that number, but they do give us enough information to generate that number. And they tell us this number in this sentence here. It says, in 2020, there were approximately 1.1 million registered handguns in Canada, with 1 million registered to individuals. This represents a 74% increase since 2010. With those two numbers, we can figure out what the yearly increase has been over the last decade. So you take your 1.1 million and you divide it by 74%, or divide by 1.74. And you get a number of 632,184. That would be the starting point at the end of 2010, approximately, roughly speaking. Uh, it is approximate numbers based on their numbers, but that's going to be pretty close to what it was. And then from here, it's pretty simple math. You take your 1.1 million, you take out your 632,000, and then you're left with the change over a 10-year period, and you divide by 10 which gives us a yearly change of 46,781. Now, being that these are based on approximate numbers, and because I like simple numbers, I'm actually going to round that down to a nice even 45,000. It makes calculating the rest of the numbers just easier and simpler. And by rounding this number down, since these things are based on approximate numbers, 
the smaller this number is, actually, the better the Liberals' government's argument is and the better the gun control lobby's arguments are. So I'm going to round in their favor here to bring these numbers down to just an easier round 45,000. Plus, the numbers are originally based on an approximation, so it's entirely possible that this is actually the correct direction to round it. But, but whatever, we're calling it 45,000 per year. And it's worth noting, this is actually the individual number of handguns in the country that has changed over that period of time, not the registration certificates. For example, if somebody sells a used firearm to their brother, that's a new registration certificate, but that's not a new handgun. That handgun just went over there. So this is 45,000 new handguns per year, roughly speaking, every year since 2010. And our second source of information actually comes from Statistics Canada itself. This is an article they put out earlier this year on January 30th, and it's titled Firearms and Violent Crime in Canada 2022. So table four, it says police reported firearm-related violent crime incidents by type of firearm between the years 2009 and 2022. Now, I think a lot of you can probably see where I'm going with this. It's always been an issue in Canada, especially around the gun control conversation, that we've never really had any concrete numbers regarding the actual raw data for exactly how many firearms there are out there, exactly what percentage of them are used in crimes, exactly which percentage of them are used by licensed firearms owners like myself, as opposed to just criminal activity, you know, how many of them exactly are acquired through international smuggling or trade, especially from the US. Uh, you know, all, all of these things, there's just never really been any good concrete numbers. And I think a lot of that is done intentionally, but a lot of it is just, those numbers really are difficult to nail down. That's, that's just the reality of it. Even if you put your best foot forward, it is difficult to do. Some jurisdictions do actually track this stuff per jurisdiction, and they do have pretty good numbers, but there's no national Canada-wide database on this information, and that's something that always comes up. But what we can calculate is the change from year to year. That's actually very easy to calculate. Now, being that this video is about C21 specifically, I am gonna emit one of the years on this chart. I'm not doing it to cherry pick my numbers, although it might look that way, so I do want to explain why I'm doing this, but I'm going to eliminate the year 2022. And the reason for that is not because it's a higher year or anything like that. As you can see, it's, it's 7,326 incidents. That's quite a bit higher than any of the other years on this chart. The reason I'm eliminating that is because Bill C-21 was announced in May of, of 2022. So the information they were operating on could not have possibly been any more recent than, than 2021 because... 2022 wasn't even done when they announced this information, so there's no possible way they could have had this year in order to calculate their numbers. But I am going to use the rest of this chart, which is as far back as this particular article goes. I could probably find more ancient information and build, you know, a bigger, larger database, but that's 12 years. That's a pretty decent sample size so that I can at least just show you guys just kind of how, how insane this gets. I am actually going to break down this chart probably in more detail once I do my full C21 versus the Charter video. But for today, we're just going to take a look at you know, start to finish, kind of broad numbers, and just really paint a picture of how ridiculous this is. So as you can see, in our starting year of 2009, there were 6,376 handgun-related violent crimes in Canada. And at our ending year, there was 6,500 exactly handgun-related violent crimes in Canada. So if you punch that into a calculator over that 12-year period, individually in between, there was ups and downs all over the place. But over that 12-year period, we saw an average of an increase of 124 or another way of looking at it is there was an increase of about 10.3 handgun-related violent crime incidences per year on average throughout that 12-year period. That assumes that every single handgun in Canada that's used in a crime had a lawful legal origin. It came from a store or it was stolen or it was straw purchased, something like that. They all exist within Canada. But as we all know, that's just statistically not true. This is another place where there's a lot of variance in the numbers. If you listen to the liberal government and to the gun control types, they say it's like closer to two thirds. You know, a third of all the handgun crime out there comes from firearms that have domestic origin and two thirds of them come from the States or Mexico or somewhere else. But if you listen to the police and pro-gun people and the CCFAR and things like that, and Pierre Polyev himself has even said that it's 90% across Canada, 90% of all handguns in Canada they come from foreign sources. They don't have a domestic origin. They're not produced or sold or traded or anything here in Canada. I don't know that the number's that high. I know it's that high in certain jurisdictions, but I don't know that it's that high nationally. So from here on out, I'm going to be putting three numbers on the screen. I'm going to have a 10% section here, a 20% section, which is the number I'm going to use, and a 30% section for to sort of keep it fair so that you can use whichever section you want. But as you're about to see, 
it really doesn't matter which section you choose because it, it, it gets ridiculous. So if you factor in that only one in every five handguns that are used in Canada in the commission of a crime have a lawful source, then our increase of 10.3 per year drops to a whopping 2.06. What this means is that the C21 handgun freeze can only possibly stop, at most, roughly two handgun crimes per year. It is worth noting that this is two crimes every year and not two handguns. A lot of times, a handgun can be used by a single person in the commission of several offenses before they are caught or stopped. So the reality is that it's actually less than two handguns every year. But because we can't know exactly what that number is, and for the sake of simplicity, we're still going to call that two handguns every year. And this is again us rounding in favor of the anti-gun argument. So what this all means is that at most, two of the handguns used in crime per year are the direct result of the new 45,000 handgun sales for that year. On average, across a 12-year time span, from 2009 all the way to 2021, nationwide in Canada. That's just what the facts are. That's the statistical reality of what C21 at least attempts to target. This gets even more ridiculous when you calculate it as a percentage. Now that the percent number that I'm trying to calculate here is actually the percent of all of the handguns that come into Canada lawfully and are sold and owned and used by lawful Canadians like myself. What percentage of those are safe and what percentage of those end up being used in a crime? Now it's worth noting, when something is used in a crime, that doesn't necessarily mean it was stolen or straw purchased or anything. That can also mean that I go rogue and I decide to hurt somebody. I'm not doing that, obviously. But somebody like me, a law-abiding citizen who has a RPAL, they can also be the ones committing these crimes. These aren't just people with who are career criminals. This includes everybody. And so, without any further ado, drum roll, please. Check this out. Check, check out these numbers. So this is 10%, this is 20%, this is 30%. So if we take a look at our 20% estimate, that is every one in five handguns used in a crime in Canada have a lawful origin. We see that the percentage of handguns used that will never ever hurt anybody ever, remember, because this is a yearly difference, is 99.995% of all handguns in Canada over a 12 year period that come into the country every year there's a 99.995% chance that they will never ever hurt anybody. This is the stat the C21 handgun freeze was specifically targeted at changing. What this means is that 0.005% of all handguns with lawful origins being used in crime was an unacceptable amount of risk that they had to kill the entire commercial handgun market in Canada in order to quote, keep our streets safe. That is, that is insane. Like, I, I can't even believe that that's the number you can calculate. Because, like, we all knew it was high. And we all kind of always said, oh, it's, you know, 95% or 99% or 99.9%. No, it's... It's 2 divided by 45,000 is what it is. And those two also assume that those two crimes either A, are 100% correlative to handgun ownership, which, when you put all of this information onto a graph... You can't make that you can't make that rational connection. And then two, it also assumes that the crimes that were committed with these handguns would just disappear if they didn't have access to a handgun. Or even just access to firearms. You know, if a guy goes up to a person in the street and, and pulls out a handgun and robs them at gunpoint, the idea that, that person won't be able to just have another handgun that they acquired illegally, or the idea that they won't just use a rifle or a shotgun or something of those measures because that does happen. Or the idea that they won't just use a different kind of weapon. You know, like a hammer or a knife or a baseball bat, just anything. I mean, <laughs> lots, of, lots of weapons out there in the world. So the idea that even if you could save those two incidences per year, as, as though that would somehow make a difference, realistically that's not a tangible argument. Because there just isn't a 100% correlation between firearm accessibility and crime rate. And that's actually really self-evident once you put all of this information onto a graph. So if you take a look at this graph here, we're going to start by putting on the change in firearms ownership over the last 12 years. We're going to call it 45,000 per year every year, even though we don't technically have the numbers for 2009 or 2021. But I don't imagine that the numbers in those years are going to be you know, wildly different than they were during the average of the 10-year span that we calculated in between 2010 and 2020. So if we put all these numbers on a graph, you can see a directly linear increase of handgun ownership over the 12-year period. 
if you then plug in the 12 separate data points from table four in our StatsCan chart, you can see that there is, they're kind of just up and down all over the place. But if you look at the start point and the end point, it's basically flat. This graph is entirely to scale. And you can see a pretty dramatic increase in firearm ownership between 2009 and 2021. So if you remember from our first article, they actually said there was a 74% increase in handgun ownership between 2010 and 2020. Now, if you actually include 2009 and 2021 in there, that number actually starts getting pretty close to a doubling. It's not quite a doubling, but it's close to a doubling in handgun ownership over the last 12 years. And yet you can see the start point of, of handgun crime and the end point of handgun crime basically flat. You've had basically flat handgun crime. So the myth that's been perpetuated by the, the gun control lobby and by the liberal government saying that more handguns equals more crime. I mean, these are the raw numbers. You can just see for yourself. There is no correlation of any kind. Statistically, that's just not factually true. And they always say, you know, it's just common sense. And maybe it is, but the stats don't lie. The facts don't lie. Sometimes the statistical reality of the universe defies all logic and reason. And, and I'm not even just talking politics. I mean, that, that's just how science is. You take a look at things like quantum physics. Quantum physics do not work anything like the rest of the world. They just don't. They defy all reason and all logic. You know, my, macroscopic physics and microscopic physics are not the same thing. You could make whatever common sense argument you want, but it's just not true. It just, just isn't true. And the same is true here. You can make whatever common sense argument you want about handguns and the handgun freeze and about firearm ownership meaning more crime, but statistically, it's just not true. And it's so untrue, it's almost even ridiculous. Not only is it not true because the graph is flat, but also because you have linear increases per year and you have random increases and decreases per year between 2009 and 2021. Now, when I say random, it's actually not really all that random. If you break this graph up in a different way and say, I don't know, put a divider right in the middle of that chart somewhere, like, I don't know, around 2015. Well, I don't know what happened in 2015, but let's just see, you know, right in the middle. Let's see what, what this graph looks like. Now let's add a little bit of color to it for dramatic effects so that you guys can really see exactly where that divider is. Now, another way to look at these numbers is to graph them by rates rather than by flat numbers. In all countries around the world, crime has a pretty linear correlation to population size. That's why you always hear about crime being expressed as a crime rate. The rate per 100,000 is usually more indicative of relative crime levels than any flat number is. If we chart this information again using rates this time, our graph looks more like this. As you can see, the lines go in opposite directions. Handgun crime rates actually went slightly down over this 12 year period, despite the fact that again, handgun ownership nearly doubled in the same time frame. However, with handgun ownership rates being considered, the line is less steep. But this again shows, without a doubt, there is little to no statistical correlation between lawful handgun ownership and handgun crime in Canada. This may not be true in other countries, but it's certainly true in Canada. You might also be thinking, wait, it, it's going down? But what about all this I've heard about crime skyrocketing out of control? And that's largely true, but that's only because crime dropped precipitously between 2009 and 2013. It has been on a pretty significant climb back to its original 2009 numbers since the year 2015. Stats Canada has even noticed this trend. If we look back at their 2020 article on this same topic, they point out this observation in multiple places. They also have a graph which shows very clearly how the firearm violence problem in Canada is very likely a manufactured problem. Historically, crime rates and gun violence have always followed each other very closely. If violent crime goes up, gun crime goes up. If violent crime goes down, gun crime comes down. Really is that simple. This graph also shows the correlation. However, what this graph points out most importantly is the significant change in proportionality since 2015. Since 2015, the proportion of firearms used in violent crime has jumped up significantly. And this is very obvious when you look at the graph. You can see in 2015, that marks the first year, our blue line, which is our firearm related violent crime, actually overtakes our orange line here, which is all violent crime. You can see in 2015 very clearly, that marks a changing point that really flips the status quo. And I wonder what happened in 2015. I don't know, it's a mystery. Now, all jokes aside, this really is no laughing matter. Uh, people are getting hurt by this. Like these, the, it's all well and good to look at a graph and say, oh, look how things are going. But these are, these are real people at the end of these numbers. They aren't just statistics which is 
why this is so important to get this right. It's not just for, for my rights and freedoms and your rights and freedoms, but it is also for the sake of public safety. The government has told us for years now that we need to ban all of these guns for public safety. That's the reason we need to do it. But as you can clearly see, it has no effect. Statistically speaking, that's not, a, that's not an accurate statement. What is accurate though, is to blame governments for their bad policies. It is imperative that we stop using scapegoats with the gun control conversation because the ultimate goal should be public safety. Now, I haven't presented enough information in this video to directly blame the government for this, and there may very well be other reasons in addition to their failings. But what you can see here is very clearly this particular government's failings on their approach to, to public safety, and then they're using us as a scapegoat to cover for their failings. And that's, that's why this is so important to really put this conversation to bed and kind of why I'm also doing my C21 versus the Charter series. The ultimate goal would be for some judge or some lawyer somewhere to hear this and to really cue into what's going on. Just how, how ridiculous this is and have, for example, maybe even the Supreme Court. I mean, so that's a little lofty for a YouTube channel, but somebody somewhere has to take note of this and has to stop this. I mean, one of the things, you remember back in the day, you know, a decade ago during the Harper times, the the Supreme Court put the abortion debate to rest. It's just over. That's not even a it's not even a political topic anymore, because the Supreme Court has laid down an ironclad decision regarding abortion. Now the Supreme Court, in my opinion, should also lay down an ironclad decision regarding firearm ownership, regarding handguns, rifles, semi-automatic rifles, magazine capacities. We need to really nail this down so that governments can no longer use it as a debate. It should no longer be a political talking point. Now, whether you think that means we need to have firearm rights in Canada is something that needs to be enshrined in the Constitution like a Second Amendment like the Americans have, or some other answer, or you think it needs to go the other way and ban every single firearm so that we never talk about this again. I mean, either way, the end result would be the same. As unfortunate as, <laughs> you know, if it goes that way, I'm not happy with that. That wouldn't make any sense either, especially with what I showed you in this video. Because then, at, at the very least, it would no longer be a variable that, for anyone to consider. And then we'd actually have to take a look at the real things that are causing public safety issues, the real things that are causing crime to skyrocket. And it's not the lawful ownership of firearms. It never has been, and it never will be. So, I'd like to thank you guys all for watching. What do you guys think about what I said? I, I was... Did you know that, that the stats were this skewed? I mean, like, I knew they were bad, but I didn't know they, they were that bad. I kind of... Like, I had to stop and make this video because that's, that's kind of ridiculous. That's, that's, I am, yeah, flabbergasted at discovering those numbers. Like, I've been looking at the numbers for quite a while, and I've always seen speculative numbers and slightly biased numbers, but there wasn't ever really a good way for me to nail down exactly what they were until I had this idea of comparing yearly increases rather than trying to figure out static numbers. Because if you can calculate the delta or the change in something, you can actually derive some pretty... Pretty good information, I think, from that, as, as I showed here. That's that's some pretty, I think, pretty damning evidence. And it's not like I was cherry-picking my numbers. That was StatsCan's numbers over a 12-year period. I mean, hard to get better empirical data than that. And, and at the very least, harder for a YouTuber to get better empirical da data than that. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. And I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next video.